Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, those who have joined from other countries. Good evening, and good night. Welcome to this forty-sixth webinar of English Language Teachers Association of India. LTI is organizing these sessions since third May, twenty twenty. Let's know more about English Language Teachers Association of India through a video. Thank you, everyone. We are happy to share that LTI is launching its reading club to improve and inculcate the reading habits amongst us. As we all know, that we cannot grow our knowledge; we can increase or widen our knowledge through books. The inauguration for the same is being organized on 30th March 2021 at 7 p.m. Please join us. On 30th March, by registering at the following link, you can see the link in your pop-up boxes. And before and after this, I wish to welcome Dr. Smriti Singh, the moderator of the session, who is an associate professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Patna. She was a former Fulbright FLTA at the University of. Austin at Texas during 2005 and 6 she has supervised four phd thesis in areas of language 
language and language teaching and education. Her areas of research interest include ELT, Indian writings in English, and post-colonial and diasporic writings. Dr. Smriti Singh, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shavin, for the warm introduction. On behalf of Eltai Patna chapter, I welcome all of you for today's session. Before we go in for the talk, I would like to briefly introduce the speaker for the day, that's Dr. Shankar Ashish Dutt. Dr. Dutt is a retired, retired as professor and head department of English, Patna University in April 2020. He has been the former chairman of Bihar Sangeet Martak Academy and former principal of Patna College of Arts and Craft. Professor Dutt has been a UGC, British Council and American Center resource person for English studies and has lectured and chaired seminars at very eminent institutions. He is on the advisory board, governing body, board of studies, and academic council of a number of universities and institutions, and a consultant for various international educational organizations. He has trained the master's and PhD coursework syllabi in the universities of Bihar, Central University of South Bihar, Maulana Mazadul Haq University and Nalanda Open University. Professor Dutt has been the guest editor for the second volume of the Journal on Migration published by Data Institute of Social Sciences and the chief editor of the Patna University Research Journal. A number of his research students have been Fulbright scholars and many hold distinguished positions in the academia, the civil services, the judiciary, corporate houses and in social services. He has been honored with a number of awards, including the Best Teacher Award by Patna University, the Frank Anthony Award, Rotary and Alliance Club Awards for his, teaching and for his teaching, Research and Citizenship, Research Award by Patna University in 2019, and the Distinguished Zavarian Award. The title of today's talk is English Studies in India, History, Politics, and Pedagogy. All of us are aware of Macaulay's minutes on education, and most of us share affiliations with the departments of English across the country and at the international level as well. In the 21st century, what is it that the departments of English need in order to maintain their presence in the academia, or will these departments be devalued like the other language departments in the course of time? Are we just going to be a body which is importing language proficiency in order to make graduates employable? Or do we have a bigger role to play? These issues are very relevant in the 21st century, especially in the context of the national education policy, which recommends that primary education must be in the mother tongue. I hope Dr. Dutt's talk today will help us rethink these issues and look for newer perspectives in broadening the field of English studies in India and across the globe. With these words, I welcome Dr. Dutt. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Audible, um, so yeah, very, very, very unfortunately, uh, there is a huge problem with uh, my laptop. Therefore, I've had to go back to the. Uh, to, I'm using my uh, Android phone for that purpose. I hope things work out right. So let's get started. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this talk, uh, which is the forty-sixth uh, lecture of El Tai. And today I will be discussing um, a few ideas associated with English studies in India, history, politics, and pedagogy. Let me begin with an excerpted critique of Eurocentricism from the distinguished Kenyan writer Gugi Wathwong's work, Decolonizing the Mind, which most students of post-colonial literature are likely to have read. African children who encountered literature in colonial schools and universities were thus experiencing the world as defined and reflected 
in the European experience of history. Their entire way of looking at the world of the immediate environment was Eurocentric. Europe was at the center of the universe. The earth moved around the European intellectual scholarly axis. Decolonizing his own mind began with the, with the change of his name from James Thiong Gugi to Gugi Wa Thiong, and then writing in his native Gikuyu. He has been visiting professor of English and comparative literature at Yale and Irvine, California. This ambivalent biographical aside is significant. Locating English studies within a post-colonial context, uh, I wish to begin by questioning the validity of English studies in India. Why is it necessary uh, to learn English in post-colonial India, which seeks to dismantle the imperial structures of knowledge and forms of representation in the English language and redefine India with free India's cultural properties. Isn't this what decolonization means? The next question that arises is, is English a foreign language today? From the official and institutional point of view, English is grouped together with other modern European languages and many central and state universities have named their centers English and modern European languages. Let me interrogate the second question first. I think the relative importance of English in India is overwhelmingly greater than other modern European languages. And secondly, English has found a home in India to occupy a significant place among other Indian languages. This may be gauged by the fact that 12.18% of Indians speak English in India which is more than twice the population of the United Kingdom and is second only to the United States. Imagine a visit to a mall. It is not an ordinary mall, but one in which all the languages and literatures of the world are on retail display. As we enter, our body temperature is recorded and our hands are sanitized, peering over our three-ply mask as recommended by ICMR, we observe the central display platform. First, the languages on display are based on the data collected from the 22nd edition of Ethnologue that lists which languages have the most speakers. So here is the list. The first five, one English, two Mandarin, three Hindi, four Spanish, five French, and six Arabic. This constitutes, we assume, the first display. Behind the first display is another that will probably display some of the other Indian languages. Seven Bangla, 11 Urdu, 15 Marathi, six Telugu, 17 Punjabi, 19 Tamil, 20, 29 Gujarati, 30 Kannad, 41 Malayalam, 64 Maghi, and so on. Secondly, the exhibits are hierarchically arranged in terms of data, such as books published by language, newspaper and magazine production, film and video production and distribution of language on the internet. So if you have a look at the first table, we will observe that English has 200,698 titles comprising a total of 21.84% of those that are published. We move down to Chinese, which is 10.99. And finally, we come down to Italian, Dutch and Portuguese, which are all, as you can see, in single digits in terms of percentage points. As we move on to table two, newspaper and magazine production by language, here again, you'll notice the overwhelming number of titles in English, 2499, with a percentage total of 62.55, and all the rest of the languages come down to single digit percentage points. We move down to the third table now, scholarly journal production by language. English has a percentage of 45.24%, with 28,131 titles. And except for German, that enters double digits in terms of total percentage points, 
all the rest of the languages are in single digits. We come to table four. Film and video production by language. Here again, 34.89% of the total titles are in English. And we come down to, uh, we feel there's the Hindi features there, 0.252%. Then distribution of languages on the internet. English has 56.43% of the total web pages that you have in millions. And finally, coming down to Dutch with 1.92. And therefore, all the other languages exist in single digit percentage points. The source of this is Sergei Lobachev, Casual Reference Librarian, London Public Libra Library, Ontario, Canada. In each of these categories, English occupies a place of preeminence. Now, Meghna Pant, the author of the novel One and a Half Wife and short stories such as Happy Birthday and Trouble with Women, states in an interview to Hindu, according to the India Book Market Report 2016, India is the sixth largest publisher in the world overall and the second largest publisher in the world of English language books. Almost 2,250 uh, books are published per day. 55% of the sales are of English books, 35% of Hindi, and the rest are regional language books. 65% of the English language sales come from Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, and Kerala. Also, contrary to popular perception, on an average, Indians read around 2.1 books a week which according to the World Culture Score Index is what Indians spend more time than that's their country globally. That's sir. Yes. A, can you please tell me when to navigate this slide? Okay. Uh, we can move across to the next slide, please. Is it okay? Yeah. Next one. You can simply mention next by which I can navigate. Fine, I'll tell you. I'll tell sure. you. Thank you. In a country of wonderful linguistic diversity, English, as a result of its history, has emerged as a language of administrative, judicial, and academic cohesion. The culture industry, for instance, has been quick to co opt this advantage. When we walk down any marketplace, we have probably noticed that a large number of commercial signboards are in English. This is not necessarily true only of metropolitan and urban locations. But deep inside the smaller towns and villages, it is not surprising to find full moon haircutting saloon written in English. Sometimes, of course, both full and saloon are spelled incorrectly in accordance with the phonological characteristics of the local language speakers. When babies are born and occasionally before they are born, parents worry about their child's admission to good English medium schools. Products are advertised in English. Healthcare is advertised in English, including indigenous cures for COVID-19. And even Hindi films are advertised in English. The media spin doctors very cleverly mix codes to attract customers in the language they understand with the lifestyle choices that constitute their aspirations. Now to the first point. When Queen Elizabeth I granted the royal commission to the East India Company in 1600, it anticipated a significant change in the linguistic and cultural history of India. With the arrival of British colonialism, English became the language of governance, of privileged education, uh, of law, of commerce, indeed of the urban public domain. Masked in altruism and philanthropy, English was not merely a language to be learned, but an imposition of a culture and a set of ideologies that constructed Indians into ways of being and seeing. In the year 1577, when Shakespeare was 13, there were two kingdoms. One was expansive, mighty, and magnificent, cosmopolitan and affluent. Stanley Wolpert, in The New History of India, says, 
that the average peasant earned adequate incomes and paid moderate taxes, while diver diversities and cultural practices were fairly treated. This was India. The other was underdeveloped, semi-feudal, split with religious factionalism, illiteracy, and questionable sanitation, whose queen bathed once a month. This was England. The Indian emperor, uh, empire was ruled by Akbar, the most powerful monarch in the world, a successful military and diplomatic strategist, a philosopher, and a gracious patron of art, music, and literature. Akbar earned an annual revenue of 17.5 million pounds, and India's share of the GDP, the global GDP, was 25%. And at the end of British colonialism, it was roughly 4%. In contrast to Akbar, Elizabeth was weak and feeble, her court divided, her palace rickety, and the English population lived in conditions of misery and diseases, such as the Black Death and sweating disease. Now, the sweating disease was a mysterious, contagious disease that struck England in uh, 1485 and later on uh, traveled to continental Europe and con continued as a series of epidemics till 1551. It was in the same year that Francis Drake set out to circumnavigate the world, and the philosopher John Dee conjured up the first image of the British Empire. Ralph Fitch, a, mem a merchant who came to Akbar's court that year, wrote home about the sheer splendor and astonishing riches of this country. Between 1589 and, 19 and 1592, Christopher Marlowe wrote Dr. Faustus, which contains these lines. I'll have them fly to India for gold, ransack the ocean for ocean pearl. Ralph Fitch was made the governor of Elizabeth's Levant Company, which would signpost the four centuries of asymmetrical exchange that would alter the history of both the countries, writes Alex von Tulsenman in a book called The Indian Summer, The Secret History of the End of an Empire. In the process of cultural colonization, post Charles Grant, Macaulay, and Charles Wood, as Baldwin writes, Shakespeare would become the most coveted cultural export to India. Shakespeare would be read in order to learn Englishness and English and valued over and above other forms of cultural production. As a result, the teaching of Shakespeare and English history was also a part of colonialism's cultural project. Shakespeare would aid cultural colonization in spite of himself, and then in the course of time, enrich it beyond imagination with its decolonized revisitings, rereadings, adaptations into kindred arts, performances, classroom lectures, and in academic webinars without Britain necessarily at, as its primary focus. Post-independent India has had an ambivalent attitude to English. On the one hand, Nehru's famous address, Tryst with Destiny, was in English. The Constitution of India was drafted in English, and the resistance to colonialism was paradoxically enabled through the assimilation of the ideas of rationalism, civil liberty, and constitutional self-government studied substantially in English. It was a befitting reply in the language of the colonizers as India translated its quest of freedom to the global community. However, some regional leaders in the name of post-colonial overhaul and cultural decolonization wanted English to be driven out of the shores of India while their children studied in privileged English medium schools. The well-known cultural critic Ajaz Ahmed has something interesting to say about this. If the British brought English to India, they also brought modern parliamentary democracy and its agencies of governance and the railway system. Do we also want to throw the Indian railways out? While the debate raged, something significant happened, globalization and liberalization of the economic order. The world was destined to become, in Marshall McLuhan's phrase, a global village to describe the instantaneous sharing of culture enabled by technological development. And English became its lingua franca. 
Today, the English language is a language of global access to knowledge, to technology, to education, to employment, to trade, to commerce, and indeed to lifestyle choices, a multi-layered preferential signifier of privilege and also of exclusion. Paralleling the socioeconomic context, it would be useful to observe the changes in higher education since its institutionalization in colonial India, which may roughly be divided into three phases. The first begins with Macaulay's Minutes on Education in 1835, where the function of education was to educate the indigene, inferiorized through colonial discourses. Macaulay's recipe was to instruct Indians in blood and color to become English in taste, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. If the, if the racially inferior Indian could receive European enlightenment's cultural, intellectual, and moral instruction, they would be adequately qualified to assume subordinate responsibilities in administering the empire. The second begins in independent India, when higher education was conceived of as an activity that broadens the mind, inculcates values, builds character, and makes good citizens. Aside of professional access and, and advancement, education was an agency of hope and emancipation. Each one of these valorized, valorized items that factor national development. This continued until the globe began to shrink and opportunities were sought across nations and territories. Post WTO, with five categories of educational services featuring in the multilateral agreement under GATS, that's the General Agreement on uh, Trade and Services, education was visualized as a service to be provided and consumed in a competitive international marketplace. This meant that higher education needed to pay increased attention to practical questions and applied outcomes. Higher education had to be economically and socially productive. The balancing act between quality and quantity has come in for growing public concern. India's gross uh, enrollment ratio in higher education stands at 26.3%. This is a 2018 figure, envisaged to be increased to 50% in 2035 in the NEP 2020, as compared with the tertiary education in USA, where it is 85.8%, down from 86 from 7 caused by the Trump effect. In India, the University Grants Commission, a statutory body set up by the government of India in 1956 uh, uh, for the coordination, determination, and maintenance of the standards of education, had registered uh, 60 universities when it was set up. As on 31-12-2020, there are 967 universities and 45,000 standalone institutions. Uh, the GER in my state of Bihar is below the national average at 14.4%. Tamil Nadu, it is 48.6%. Please, uh, uh, oh, we don't have those slides. 37%, in Kerala, it's 37%, 32.4% in Andhra Pradesh. 36.2 in Telangana and 28.8 in Karnataka. The, the GER is calculated in terms of enrollment in post secondary, uh, post senior secondary class divided by the total population in the age group of 18 to 23 multiplied by 100. Now, focusing on a quantitative push has produced variable quality. Lack of accountability together with other systemic failures have tended to produce poor thinkers poor communicators, inadequate performers, apart from socially and ethically compromised individuals. Three of these listed items have a direct bearing on English language skills and communication needs, namely access, equity, and quality. English studies comprise two distinct areas of emphasis. English as a subject comprising literature, criticism, critical theory, translation studies, and area studies. This area is largely content-based. Learning the English language, or for that matter, any language other than some areas of L1, as a tool of communication, 
is more like learning to ride a bicycle or swim. It is skill-based. The four skills that comprise this process are commonly referred to as LS uh, LSRW, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. When we acquire L1, the input skills, speaking and listening, occur naturally. And the output skills in the exercise of reading and writing need to be consciously developed. Reading and writing meet pedagogic and institutional demands. But in today's world of contemporary communication networks, listening and speaking skills are of utmost importance. In cultural reproduction and social reproduction, Pierre Bordeaux developed post-Marxist thinking beyond the centrality of economic power. He introduced the idea of cultural capital. All elements other than financial wealth that confers social mobility, education, intelligence, knowledge of art, art forms, dress, speech, and physical appearance. Hence, proficiency in language skills are major determinants of building cultural capital, enabling employment, social, and lifestyle inclusion. Colonial English studies refers to the instrumentality of studying English literature and culture through the asymmetrical colonial lens in order that the indigene is improved through the absorption of the branded superiority of European literature and culture. Post-colonial English studies dismantles colonial structures of representation to represent multiple constituencies, such as class, caste, gender, ethnicity, regions, language, ecology, and cultures through the lens of little narratives. These are stories of each one of us lived, um, uh, lived and imagined experience. So contemporary English studies is a dynamic process of inclusive representation of diverse distinctiveness of many truths that constitute the world we inhabit. Each one of these stories has a global right to be told. If English studies are ideally taught and learned differently from the manner in which it was engineered in the 19th century as a tool for the dissemination of the Eurocentric worldview, it is necessary to understand these differences. Number one, it has decentered Britain from its referential literary and cultural centrality. This process marked the birth of Indian English literature. Number two, it has done so by rereading many canonical texts. This is done through, the, through, through reading them differently from their cultural and linguistic encoding. Number three, in engaging with a form of decoding of texts, we have shed the cultural yoke to look at India as Indians, not through Western eyes, and at the same time, renegotiated cultural relations with the West on even terms. However, there has been a tendency towards what I like to call the similarity principle, where instead of differences, one looks for similarities and has established solidarity of common belonging to categories while focusing on literature and culture. This is equally true of other disciplines and a certain way of thinking. While there does not seem to be an apparent problem in the similarity principle, this inclusion of the similar may be read as an attempt to subsume distinctiveness and erase identity. The French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas in his treatise on ethics, speaks of the tendency of Western philosophical tradition towards totalization, which subsumes the other within the matrix of the self. The alternative to this is a welcoming approach to the embodied other in the recognition and respect for the face of the other. Difference does not mean naming an enemy. 
to welcome similarity and respect difference is the hallmark of liberalism. Liberalism is a much maligned work word today. This is not because there is much that is inherently threatening about liberalism, but because many people tend to use social media platforms as encyclopedic reference. Liberalism is a political, ethical, and economic philosophy that emphasizes individual autonomy, equality of opportunity, and protection of individual rights to life, liberty, and property. John Locke is credited with the founding of this philosophy in two treatises in 1690. For thousands of years, humankind lived under oppressive regimes that allowed few political rights, economic opportunities, or personal liberties, and restricted movements of individuals and goods. But people fought back for their freedom and step by the well-known historian and public intellectual Yuval Noah Harari states that during the 20th century, elitist metropolitan centers formulated three grand stories that seemed to explain the past and predict the future. The fascist story, the communist story, and the liberal story. The fascist story was knocked out by the Second World War, and from the mid-80s, mid-40s mid to the 80s, the world debated communism and liberalism until the communist story ended in 1989. The liberal story gained credibility with the growth of democratic institutions as people began to think critically for themselves through access to education and opportunities for employment, trusting reason over bigotry of priests and demagogues. It was an acceptable world, not a perfect one. Literature respond to the dialogues of thoughts created discourses that shaped the world and enabled its nuanced understanding. However, the liberal story has morphed into neoliberal global policies where the interests of corporate greed and nolliglusters have come together to stifle liberal aspirations. The liberal story was one that enabled India to gain its independence and build a nation based on a constitution that embodies these values. The reactionary revisionism therefore seeks to undermine the Lockean essentials of rights, separation of church and state, and Thomas Paine's thought that even at its best, the state is a necessary evil. John Stuart Mill's On Liberty begins with the statement that the tyranny of the government needs to be regulated by the liberty of its citizens. Emergency and the Indian English novel Memory, Culture, and Politics by writer Mary Virtha, published in 2019 by Rutledge, and later the South Asian edition, which came out in 2020, examines the cultural trauma of the Indian emergency through a reading of five seminal novels by Salman Rushdie, Shashi Tharoor, Nantara Saigal, and Rohington Mystery, attempting to preserve the forced erasures and fading memory of its human rights violations and suppression of democracy. In the 80s, 1980s, and 90s, Indian English novelists constructed a literary counter narrative, a countercultural memory that challenged the state's official version of that period that simultaneously infused state sponsored forgetfulness. Salman Rushdie in Imaginary Homelands articulates the resistance to official versions of truth, the strategies of erasure of memory and the response of writers within the commonality of space. And he writes, writers and politicians are natural rivals. Both groups try to make the world in their own images. They fight for the same territory. And the novel is one way of denying the official political version of truth. Paul Ricoeur, in Remembering and Forgetting, has discussed the ethical and political duty to remember. And he states, a basic reason for cherishing the duty to remember is to keep alive the memory of suffering over again, over against the general tendency of history to celebrate the victors. We need, therefore, a kind of parallel history of, let us say, victimization, which would offer a counter history of the success and victory. To memorize the victims of history, the sufferers, the humiliated, the forgotten, will be the task of all of us. 
The study of literature is never complete without relating events from the past to those of the present to observe how the cunning corridors of history revisit us. Our inability to do so is because of our historical and critical illiteracy, prejudices, or sheer indifference. Literatures and cultures have flourished best when writers and artists have performed without restrictions imposed by the state and those co-opted from civil society by the state. Tagore's Where the Mind is Without Fear is probably its most appropriate anthem, as is Faz's Bol Kit Lab Azad Hai Tere, or the contemporary relevance of Subramanya Bharti, who wrote, In ancient times, do you think there was not the ignorant and the shallow minded? And why, after all, should you embrace so fondly a carcass of dead thoughts? Live in the present and shape the future. Do not cast lingering looks on the distant past, for the past has passed away, never again to return. Liberal thought is a movement towards pluralism and cosmopolitanism that accommodate diversity, an attitude and a worldview that respects the face of the other. It is different from the metropolitan that privileges materially induced lifestyle choices. Many Indian urban dwellers are metropolitan. Few are cosmopolitan, despite the efforts of writers and performing artists. The cosmopolitan space is shrinking alarmingly. The value of literature and the humanities in many ways is an antidote to the shrinkage. English studies, which includes Bhasha literature and translation, gives us a wonderful opportunity to view a world beyond our own and to acquire a broader perspective and in Levinas's words, to recognize the embodied other. Yes, the next slide, uh, number six. Sharing my thoughts today would be incomplete without the pedagogy of English studies and the need to transform existing paradigms and to go beyond the institutional framework. Number one, the syllabus. Within an institutional framework, every curriculum has a syllabus that is framed by self-assured professors who would have several worldviews. They could, for instance, look forward to 2030 or glorify 1960. The syllabus would include international constituencies of creativity, together with a holistic view of contemporary literature, including translated works, kindred arts, philosophy and the sciences, or be confined to canonical texts of British India with a few American authors thrown in. When you drive, you don't look at the rear view mirror, except occasionally. You look through the windshield. Remember Subramanya Bharati. Second, the democratization of pedagogy is a prime requirement for English studies. The narrative of teaching learning is much like the narratives that grow out of fundamental sentence structure in English, subject, verb, object. The teacher is a subject. She or he acts upon the pupil who is the object of this exercise. The objectification of the pupil alienates the learner. The transformation of the structure into a subject-subject relationship with the pupil becoming a co-sharer in the process of producing knowledge is likely to yield more desirable results. Three, the, road, the roadblock to rote learning. For many in the academia, teaching is a mechanical transfer of a time-worn mental archive from a passive possessor to a passive recipient. It is in continuity with a colonial tradition of derivative scholarship to cram well-worn subject into a given number of well-worn heads. This was Walter Raleigh. Maintenance of the scores suits the mechanics of the market because publishers, especially those that print guidebooks, extract maximum profit from trite products that require little investment. The consequence is a pedagogic stultification that Paulo Freire terms the banking concept of education that requires students to answer predictable examination questions that test mnemonic ability rather than critical competence or 
creative intelligence. Four, the challenge of English language insufficiency. English studies need to be taught in the English language. One can get to know about English literature through a different language, but we are unlikely to be able to study English language without optimum English language competence. Regrettably, the language competence of many undergraduate, postgraduate, and occasionally research scholars and teachers is questionable. The problem does not begin with institutions of higher learning. It begins at the primary school level. The condition of primary school education in this country has been woefully deficient, though official, officially primary education is one of the significant social indicators of development. After independence, while institutions of higher learning were developed, primary education has largely been neglected. Even in some of the better primary schools, the population of the class precludes teachers from giving individual attention to young learners. The pedagogy is based on the reproduction of information as written on the blackboard if there is one, and if there isn't, as dictated by the teacher. So the pupils, so the questions and answers are either written on the blackboard or dictated. The pupil is supposed to memorize the answer and reproduce it verbatim in the examination. But what are the consequences of such a fixed deposit method? The two characteristics that differentiate human being from the rest of the animal kingdom are A, the ability to use language, and B, the capacity for rational thought. During the course of primary schooling for most students, both these functions that define what it means to be human and the right to be human are critically subtracted. The student uses the language of the teacher and the thoughts of the teacher without being able to expand her linguistic potential, despite most question papers beginning with the customary instruction Answer the following questions in your own words as far as practicable. The phrase as far as practicable looms over in your own words like an evil spirit that threatens to signpost the grade one is likely to get if a student dares to be adventurous enough to exercise individual initiative. Such a student in the course of time enters the portals of higher education deprived of critical intelligence, of not knowing how to think differently from what the student has been taught to think and to write using surrogate models to answer questions. The student's critical skills to structure arguments logically and cogently are clearly missing. During college and university years, writing is hardly taught. Most professors indicate what is wrong with an answer or a paper but rarely is the mechanics of writing demonstrated. In the humanities and social sciences, in the manner of Chinese whispers, there's a peer persuasion. The rewards of scholarship rest upon how substantially one can quote from text critics and theorists. Where is the student in the paper or the answer? Not teaching the mechanics of writing, of academic writing, is like telling a young person to play chess without demonstrating or telling the person the rules of the game. Five, the word and the world. Literature is a window to the world beyond ourselves. With a remarkable breadth of knowledge and understanding of people, regions, nationalities, ethnicities, genders, and multiple identities of social formations, biospheres, geographies, and climates. Indeed, everything on Earth. And in the imagined other world, we feel enriched as much as it bestows upon us an ethical onus to be good human beings. It assumes special significance in an age of considerable bitterness and despair. When the world seems to be ideologically partitioned, when development and progress have many often contradictory definitions and core human needs, are subservient to lifestyle choices. It compels us to engage with literature and the kindred arts in search of understanding. Being citizens of a world without borders is a significant 
responsibility as it is to heal the world. Six, and finally, enjoy English study. The discipline is to be enjoyed, to be discussed, debated, and dialogued in tea stalls, college canteens, coffee houses, and multiple public spaces. It is not merely studied to get a certificate or a degree. Degrees and certificates today are the contemporary mutations of land documents. They occasionally enable tenuous employment, but in many cases, like many erstwhile zamindars, they do not contribute to productivity. It is time we reverse the process. Uh, I wish to thank Professor Mohan Raj for graciously inviting me to the Eltai webinar 46. Dr. Smriti Singh, the Secretary of Eltai Bihar, for many years of shared ironic perspectives, pedagogy, and her abiding faith in my heterodoxy. Dr. Newton, the convener of Eltai Bihar, for the persuasion I could not refuse, and her willing suspension of disbelief that often heightens expectations. I am thankful to Dr. Shavan for all the technological help, many of those which regrettably failed. I express my gratitude to the academics, researchers, students, and attendees of this webinar. I honestly hope I did not come in the way of a well-spent Sunday evening. Thank you very much. Are muted, Newton, ma'am. You are muted. Okay. Thank you so no, much sir, for bringing this. Thank you. Enjoy English, you said, and we truly enjoyed your session, sir. Thank you so much for such insightful, enriching, and rewarding session, sir. Your two questions at the beginning, and uh, uh, which were backed up with extremely useful data, uh, figures, and facts. They uh, spoke loud to restate the very purpose and essence of the topic English studies in India, history, politics and pedagogy. Your very emphatic remark made to those who treat English as an alien language through your question. Uh, Britishers brought uh, modern democratic uh, system and railways too. Uh, do you want to throw them out as well? Was worth pondering, sir. I am Nija Paroveti, Ganana Lagu Chetasam, Udara Charita Nantu, Vasudheva Kutumbakam. India has always believed in Vasudheva Kutumbakam since ages, and the advent of technology simply re established the concept of global village. And for this global village, the need of a global language cannot be denied upon. And thus, as used by Sir, the democratization of pedagogy is a prime requisite. May I now request the participants to put forward their questions? Nutan, the first question is being displayed. Can you please check your chat box? Uh, it's not yet there in my chat box. Let me. Um, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Dr. Lab Singh. How do you think the new education policy will change the curriculum and pedagogy in favor of Indian languages with, uh, with English language? That's the first question. So uh, that, sir, was I audible to you? Was I clear enough? Yes. You see, the, the, you know, there is always this paradox that I have uh, encountered. Uh, what do we actually mean by teaching English in the mother tongue? I mean, sorry, uh, the, the, the curriculum in the mother tongue at the primary school level. Does it actually happen? For instance, in the state of Bihar, okay, there are multiple language speakers. What they mean by mother tongue is necessarily Hindi. So, Primarily, it is not the mother tongue that we are teaching. We say it's the mother tongue, but it is not. So alienation does take place right there. See, the new education policy, as far as 
uh, its conceptual understanding is concerned, may encourage the learning of at least three languages. But what is planned and how it is executed, how it's implemented, leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, you can have any number of plans, but if you don't have the kind of faculty and the skills, I mean, uh, I'm afraid uh, all this will remain as a, a, a very well thought out document, perhaps, but uh, it's not going to give rise to any kind of results at the ground level. Yes, right, very right. So it all relies upon the execution of all those plans which are written. Uh, can we take up the next question? Uh, Dr. Uh, Vinod K. Chopra is asking, should we tell our students to consider English as one of the Indian languages and not as a foreign language to understand its importance as a global language? See, again, this, this, is, this is something if we look at the whole idea of the dialectics of language. When has a language come to exist in a particular territory? And where do we draw the line? Do we say that any language which has come into India after the 18th century is not to be considered an Indian language? Then what about all the languages that have come into India and have grown as a, as a part of uh, the, the entire cultural matrix of this country? So... Obviously, I mean, with the kind of 12.18% of speakers uh, who speak English in India, we have the huge number of books. And let us say we are, we are not talking about what is essentially, as I said, a British culture. That has been decentered. Indianness can be spoken in any language whatsoever. And as far as I'm concerned, English is certainly not a foreign language. Indian English literature, which has grown out of the use of the English language in India, is very Indian and very different from the literatures or modes of expression in any other part of the world. So I do consider English a very, very, very Indian language. So... I hope that answers the question of, of Dr. Vinod. We have another question from Dr. Punita Vijay Kumar. Uh, she asked that, uh, sir, do you agree that it is regressive that contemporary higher educational scenario where the apex body of technical education in India attempting to introduce Matra Bhasha medium for a professional course? Well, several countries have done it successfully. For example, Russia, China, Japan, these are fine examples of uh, those that have uh, been able to uh, teach technology in their own language. But I'm afraid that's going to take a long, long time. But you must also realize that uh, China spends $20 million in order to teach their children English. And as we, we observe that with the opening up of the global economy, uh, both in terms of transfer of people as well as goods. Uh, and English very clearly is the lingua franca. Yes, by all means, if you want to teach uh, technology through uh, Indian languages, A, it's going to take a very, very long time with the translation, now with the teaching, those they have, they have to be schooled in the use of the appropriate vocabulary to teach, it's going to take time, but it certainly can be done. But if it is only done through an Indian language, I'm afraid it'll be restrictive because participation with the rest of the world and professional advancement is likely to be restricted. Uh, so Deepika says, uh, you touched upon the primary flaw of uh, English exams in school. How can we change how assessment is viewed in the classroom to ensure that English is looked at as a language and not as a subject? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, there are several ways of doing it. And I think 
uh, you know, I've had a chat with many teachers and uh, I'm talking about teachers who teach in schools. And I, I do realize that they're completely overworked. I, I know how much of work school teachers need to put in because obviously there is always a deficit uh, in the ratio, in the student teachers ratio, with the teachers doing more work than they normally should be doing. As a result of which, you know, uh, if you ask a teacher what is the primary concern, they say, we want to finish the syllabus. And I don't know if you take that literally or not. I mean, whether they actually want to finish the syllabus. Uh, because I think, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of time and a lot of creativity that goes into teaching. The same thing can be taught in various different ways, provided you have the time to do so. Otherwise, yes, you finish the syllabus. Uh, so I think that uh, finally we reach the stage where uh, on behalf of LTI family, I have to propose vote of thanks. And I do not carry the formal bit of paper, sir, but a gratitude laden heart to Professor Dr. Shankar Dutt for enlightening the teaching and learning fraternity through his rewarding session. We express our thankfulness to you, sir. I extend my heartfelt thanks to all the office bearers of uh, LTI for this initiative of supporting the teaching and learning fraternity and helping the Patna chapter at every stage to host this session effectively. I express my thankfulness to the participants for their active participation and such interesting and relevant questions. My thankfulness are due to Dr. Shravan Kumar, Dr. Smriti Singh, Dr. Xavier, and all those who have extended their support for the smooth conduction of the session. Certificates will be given to the uh, English Language Teachers Association members and the students. There is an announcement for the next webinar, which is on the topic teaching reading to be hosted by LTI Delhi West chapter. I think that uh, we display that. Uh, Poster of the next seminar. Yeah, it is late. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, everyone, and thanks to Eltai. Thanks to Dr. Dutt for giving his consent to be our resource person and being so resourceful indeed in words and in action too. Thank you so much, sir. We are going to end the session.